Um, so I was invited down to talk to you guys about samples, but to get a little bit deeper than what we think of of samples on Splice and just sample packs. Um, to give you a bit more of a background on how I got into samples, I was just producing music uh, six years ago, kind of making my own sounds without really knowing that that was samples, and fell into the world of samples. Um, I wanted to put some stuff out on SoundCloud, just put some sounds out for free. Um, that kind of kicked off quicker than I thought, and I found out about this word of samples. This is a few years prior to Splice Sounds even existing. Um, and I started a company called Caps and Pro Audio with my brother, and we started putting sounds out, gaining momentum, and that led us to Caps and Pro Audio becoming part of Splice. And I now work as the creative director of Splice Sounds. Uh, that means I'm involved in the creation of packs, the concepting of packs, uh, working with the artist team to work with artists on bringing their vision to Splice and what they sound like and making that into a sample pack. One of the things we've done recently, which has been awesome, as some of you guys would have seen, is the Big Room Pack from Spinning. This is a new partnership with Spinning and Splice, which over the next 18 months are going to be bringing you genre packs and also artist packs as well. Uh, there's tons of cool stuff in the pipeline, stuff that I've already seen as well. This is the first one out. Um, I thought it'd be cool to go beyond this pack as I'm kind of known as a trap producer, hip hop producer. Uh, this is not really my world, but I was part of the process of these sounds coming about, giving feedback on this as part of the artist team to make this into the pack that it could be. This is full of super strong sounds. There's like punchy kicks in there. For me, these are sounds that it's, a, it's an amazing toolkit for this genre and for you guys that make that, this is like go-to now. Um, but I thought it'd be cool to demonstrate how you can take sounds from a different genre and bring those into what you do. And that means across the other way as well. There's a huge amount of talk with the amount of sounds being available now of people sounding similar because they're using samples. Um, one of the things I've been pushing on is getting outside of the genres that you work in. There's awesome toolkits like this that are like foundational for genre, but then digging into sounds that you wouldn't normally use and being able to bring those into what you make and using kind of basic tools to craft those into something interesting and unique for what you do. So going and getting sounds that when you first hear them, perhaps that's not drag and drop ready to go, but knowing some basic tricks and tips to get that to something you could use. So. With the Big Room Pack, as I say, this is not necessarily sounds that I would go, OK, cool, that's ready to go. I'll drag it into my session and, and leave it. But there is tons of really good quality stuff in here. And tonally, there's interesting things. Punch-wise, the, the actual uh, sonics of these sounds could be really useful. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do, I thought, to give some context for this, would be to play you some of the demo song for those of you who haven't already checked out the Big Room Pack. I imagine most of you have. I imagine most of you are aware of Splice or are Splice users. So for those of you who haven't, some context, I'll give you I'll give you this. So it's super punchy, uh, and I'm going to do something completely different with it. So I've already downloaded these. This is mainly due to I had no idea what the Wi-Fi would be like, and uh, I'm glad I did. Um, we've got all the sounds already downloaded to the Splice app, so I can just drag and drop from here straight into my session. Um, I'm using Machine, mainly because Machine for me is like a sketch pad, so I can move really quickly with audio. I can do things like if I want to change the pitch or something, I'm just twisting to go up and down 10, 20 semitones if I want to, rather than having to get in and use menus and stuff. For me, it's just been a more natural tool to do it. Um, I learned Machine when I was creating uh, Native Instruments expansions officially for these, um, and also when I was then moving into doing sounds for the MPCX and the Touch, um, working with Physical hardware is really great for sound design, especially drum design, because it's super hands-on. Sometimes getting away from just clicking can be helpful. However, 
it's definitely none of this is essential. I don't really believe in the thing of having tools that you have to use or best ways of doing things. I, this kind of is getting away from all that. This is specifically about using things as fluid sound and then already being any rules. I am kind of known within friends and people I work with in the industry that I don't really know what I'm doing half the time. I do because I've been doing this for experience for so long, but I don't necessarily go, right, I need 17% reverb here and I need to change the dry wet signal this amount. It's not really how I work. I just twist things most of the time, but through experience, I guess I do know what I'm doing at this point, but I found my way through by just playing, spending a lot of time playing with things. So the fact that you can learn everything from tutorials really specifically at this point is awesome, but also I recommend people to just play around with sound. When you're on your own and you're at your laptop or at your setup, you not getting the end result that you need that time is worth the time to play around. And like, if you don't get there that time, then you might find a trick within that for next time. That's how I learned how to do most of this was failing on trying to get the, where I wanted to lots of times, eventually, eventually getting there. So I had these sounds from the kit. Some of these have already been messed with, but I'm gonna drag something into an empty slot and just show you real quick. So we've got toms. We've got some like drum machine-esque toms. That's nice. So something like this, for instance, we've got an electro tom. The keys for doing sample creation, specifically drum creation in this, in this case, is for me is EQ, pitch, transient shaping or using ADSR to shape or is saturation and essentially molding the sound. I'm trying to do this in a way that I'm not using any plugins that people might not have, that you don't need to go and get these five plugins to be able to get to where you need. Most doors at this point have stock sounds that you, know, you don't really need to go much further. There are specific fun things you can do, but specifically for crafting sound, you don't necessarily need to. So I have this basic Tom sound. I can hear from that that, by the way, drum design involves me pressing the same sound 3,000 times. I'm sure you guys know that. <laughs> that, 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 that meme is real. Um, so we got like a high transient in there and I can hear pretty quick that we can make something like, we could probably make like a reggaeton snare with this. So we've got that click in there. So if I do something like going in, let me bring up the waveform so you guys can see this. So I'm gonna use an AHD on this. So let's just attack hold decay just to start crafting this. So that little first section, I want to bring that down. So I just have. That first little bit. So I'll start pitching. And that's the whole reason why I use machine is because I can do this so quickly. From somewhere like that, I want that first little section so I can hear a transient in there that punch, but I don't necessarily want all that bottom weight, but that I've kind of, it's become mid body now. You can do this at any step through the stage. You might want to go in somewhere and EQ, and you can EQ along the way. So as you're pitching down, you might be bringing in different frequencies, pitching up, you're bringing in different frequencies, and you can basically sculpt as you go. This is awesome doing it with existing samples. Obviously, when we're creating samples to release under Caps and Pro Audio or under Splice, this has been done from scratch. So we're doing this with Synthesis, with generating sounds, with live sounds, with Foley, stacking and mixing those things. A lot of the same things actually apply. It's awesome doing it for a track because obviously I can work with all these sounds and I can go in and pick a sample in the first place that sounds like what I'd like it to. So with that, I'm gonna go in and pick something like a Transient Master. This is the NI's inbuilt one, but I can bring up the attack a little bit. I'm just gonna add a little bit more on that Transient, bring the sustain down, cut off the end. So we've got a little punchy sound now. Now this is where I start doing things that I'm not supposed to. I'm just gonna add another Transient Master. Bring that AHD down a little bit. Next thing I'd wanna do is add some, I just deleted that Transient Master, didn't I? Good vibes. Cool. So the biggest thing with drum design that I want to do, and this is taking something like sounds I wouldn't use, and then once you start 
taking things out, removing things, you want to add weight back in. This is where saturation, soft clipping, essentially uh, perceived loudness is like the goal for drum design. Um, you can use this in your production as well. Saturation, I'm sure a lot of you guys already do. Using any type of saturation, soft clipping, is a great way to start pushing those sounds further, to start adding in body, to add character. You can use things which are emulators of vintage hardware. You can use real clean, modern plugins. Any, any time that you're actually adding weight to that sound and you're starting to push that audio further than it needs to go, you're adding in more characteristics, new harmonics, new elements to those sounds. And once you add in things, you can start molding back down again. So I'm going to use for this, uh, firstly, I could do it really simply in here, which is in machine, I have inbuilt drive. This is more of an overdrive than anything. You can see, see that start being added in. Now, if I wanted to, I could go in, bring these transient masters back out. And we start getting into the top part of a kick, right? So if I start going down, I could start cleaning that up, adding more weight in, I've got a kick. If I started going all the way back up, I could probably take this all the way back down and pretty, make, pretty much make a hi-hat out of this. If I EQ'd that out, I could take the bottom end out pretty much all together. And uh, well, I'll probably do it with a filter rather than EQ. Essentially, any of these sounds can be anything. Uh, it's all about keep going with this. You might not get to the sound you're looking for, but you might make something interesting that you can save. And I recommend once you get to a point where you like the sound, I actually wasn't expecting that. You can export these and put them into essentially your own sample library. So so what I did with these sounds was went in, spent some more time not in front of a bunch of people doing it, and found some sounds that I really liked. So this came out of one of these one shots. So I think from here we had these real strong tonal one shots and we've got super, super clean, super punchy. And what I've done is gone in, pitched it down, done the transient master. I've used something called Transify, which is another type of transient shaping, um, just another third party plugin, but I'm essentially just doing multi-band on that. So taking down the sustain of the bottom end. So we've got a far punchier, more hip hop rap kick. Done the same thing with a, kick, uh, with a clap, bunch of claps. So that's just pitched down, use the AHD to remove some of the sound from one of these punchy big room claps. We all know what that is, but punch down with, I'm sure a bunch of you know, RC20, adding a bit of grit, a bit of texture to it. Uh, these become almost back to live. So I ended up with a pattern. Overall compression on the group. And I just bounced the entire group down. So I have in here, this is my entire group. Pitch down again, reverb added, a bit of filter on that, and then layer the sounds back in. This is a cool one. So this was made from, I think, a down lifter. So this is just essentially noise from the big one pack. Taken right back down. That's essentially what these old drum machines are. A lot of the time it's just using noise. So we got essentially a little hi-hat, so
So you can see pretty quickly that from something that was completely different, so these are only the sounds from the big room pack, we can get to here. And then if I add in some context and some samples to this, so these are just samples from Captain Pro Audio from our label. Contact piano that we recorded. One thing is like all these drum sounds now from here, these separate drum sounds, I'm, I already have bounced them out for myself as some new sounds. So this kick is like an entirely new thing. Now it's not entirely the new thing if you necessarily wanted to sell that sample, but it definitely is for my own library. So this full like top loop, I tend to send, save these top loops and you can do the same thing. Saving percussive loops without kicks, saving percussive loops without snares, without claps. You start building up these top loops, and even if you don't use them for the end of your track, they're a really great start point for throwing them in to build around. You can build that percussion around that. It gives you some drive. Again, it depends on what genre you're, you're working in, and, and this kind of, I'm trying to do this in a way that translates across genres. Obviously, this depends on the type you're making, um, but it's worth keeping these in mind for experimenting. I come from a place where I very much experiment with sound. I don't necessarily have an end goal, but it's worth taking in mind that if you have a sound that you are very specifically trying to get to, if you have one element within that, that wasn't what you expected or wasn't where you planned to start from, that might be the unique element that makes that track stand out from everything else in your genre. So it's worth it even if you're like 90% working to, this is how I like to do things, this is the signature sounds that will appeal to the DJs in, in what I make and the listeners, it might be the element that you've taken a little bit further or played around with, or you've at some point in the past exported and saved, and then you've had that as, a, okay, this is a signature sound that works now, maybe six months later that I can throw in. So I encourage people to, to play around and to go further. And if you feel like a sound hasn't got to where it needs to be, maybe just export it out as some audio, start getting used to throwing things into a kind of working folder. So you've got this little toolbox of things that you can play around with. And the cool thing about this obviously is this was just working from one sample pack. I mean, spinning's coming with uh, another 18 months of sample packs that will be available on Splice. There's a world of samples out there. It's a really cool thing to do to start, especially if you're not wanting to build a full track that day or it's just not coming together, start playing around with sound. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. And if it isn't your thing as well, as I say, it's an extra element that you might be able to add in that could be a hook or could be an extra thing. So to give you another example of using the same drum sounds, these are repitched. So, I mean, these are like really saturated out. This is a lot of a lot of weight's been added, and then I'm filtering off the top end again, cutting out some of that bottom end, but I mean, we can keep doing that. Okay, so we got a completely different thing, but with the same original samples. So I'm going to add in one of these tonal kicks. And take off the beginning of it, so I take the attack out. I might actually just go into the sample together, cut some of that out. Okay, 
Echo. we got a little bit of go between the low end on that kick and that but you know start going in and EQing and sculpting this is pretty rough right now but starts working are easier to put in here but like it's cool using this stuff that I heard these in, in context and they wouldn't have necessarily been something I'd go for but adding a little bit of effects this one just added some delay and reverb keyboard. So essentially that's all of the same sounds from the big room pack, which means that I've used probably 15 sounds in total on that, apart from the melodic loops on top of that. Main reason for this, as I say, is to kind of show you guys that there's a whole life beyond the samples that you're choosing. And because there's so much choice with samples, which is awesome, like I'm now blown away by the amount of choice I have, but sometimes that can be um, a little stifling when you're trying to make a track and you can be, end up going through hundreds of samples to find what you're looking for. The splice search is amazing for that. And it's like curating sounds is far easier than it ever used to be. So it does make a big difference. But sometimes you want to just like go the extra mile to find something within these sounds that isn't already there. So some of these tricks, the saturation, EQ, pitching, and I mean like crazy pitching, and then going in and sculpting sound is a really good way of giving new life to these samples. So 
I recommend going in the stuff you already have, maybe samples that you're bored with, samples that you haven't used before, to go in and start playing with it. And it's obviously the same thing with melodics, but that's like a whole other world to get into. So yeah, I, I thought I thought this would be interesting to go through. It's a very niche thing that I do, and usually this would be like an hours and hours process. So this is like barely scratching the surface, but it's cool to have some tools which are really simple things that usually you can just do with stock tools inside your door. Um, so yeah, I thought it'd be cool to take some questions, if anyone has any. Um, anything on the sample industry, sound creation, uh, my story of how I even got into running a sample label, which is a really niche thing in itself. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to open up for questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will come to you and then state your name in the or question. Or as technical as you want. but. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's really cool that you, I'm, I'm actually really surprised that you made like a soulful R&B track out of a big room sample pack. Um, is, is it like, is that also the purpose of the sample pack or is it like more big roomish orientated or how do you say it? Is, is that also the purpose of the sample pack to make it wider? for a brighter, a wider audience or? The reason for genre packs usually, like this actually falls into like, because this is spinning, this is their first pack with Splice and this is like a perfect foundational pack for that genre. So no, I don't think that's the intention. And, and we actually, when we were working with the, the spinning team on this as well, like the idea with this is like, this is a core foundational elements pack. And it really is that these are like super powerful, punchy uh, individual elements that you can put together. And like, it's what you want from that. For me, when I, I work a lot with concepting sample packs, with uh, coming up with what's next, and that's different for my label, um, my vocal label, 91 Vocals, that Kate, the other director of the company, is here today as well. We think a lot about it's, it's packaging, and that's not packaging in terms of necessarily selling, that's giving context for sounds, right? Because as much of the, the artwork, the name of the pack, the info, the demo song, these things are not just there to sell you on a pack, they're there to catch your attention. They're a little flagpole for you saying, hey, this, this might be for you. And obviously, like all of this stuff is subjective. Sounds are just sounds, right? Like Pretty much every sample pack will have something in there that could work across genre. Um, it's more so about knowing that there's stuff there specifically for you and can do exactly what you need it to do when you need it, which is awesome. And that used to be practically impossible to just go into a thousand kicks and find the exact one you were looking for. That's super easy now, especially with something like Search on Splice Sounds. But this is about just knowing that sometimes you want to dive in at the deep end of something that maybe wasn't deliberately you know, shown that this was for you because you might be missing out on things that aren't being directly tailored to you. And really, sample packs are a wrapper for sounds anyway. Yeah, it's more of a guideline and a tool to help you be creative in, yeah, sure. in your own way, actually. All right. Any more questions? Um, hello. I have Hi. a Machine Studio Pro. Um, at home that I don't really use, but the other day, last last month, I was like, hey, it's just sitting there, um, and you know, I have this hardware where you can do a lot of different things like sampling. Um, how long, how long of a time do you spend like during a day just making samples on machine or something, and is it super difficult? Um, so probably two parts. Um, knowing machine inside out and like the reason I use machine was not massively uh, a choice I kind of fell into it like as I say like I um, through making sounds um, uh, under Capson Pro Audio and myself as Capson um, we got to a point where we were doing expansion packs for machine officially through native instruments and I had a little bit of experience with machine like I had one but I think like a lot of people had spent a little bit of time with it kind of knew the basics but Sometimes when you get to the point where you need to start finding out how to do something you're not really sure, sometimes you can look at it, look it up and sometimes you don't bother and you kind of never really find out. I went through a really intense, like, I have to learn how to do this because I was creating sounds for the product. So I, for the first time ever, was like reading manuals and stuff. It, the, the learning curve is not that much and you don't need to know everything. It's more like having enough that you don't get frustrated. So, you know, um, for making sounds themselves, um, I work with Reason as well. I have the weirdest setup because I work with Machine and Reason which is like crazy. Like I, I use everything else as well. Like I have all the other doors as you can probably see, but um, I use things for specific jobs and specific tools. You know, um, I use Reason just because I've been using it for 15 years now. So it's like a tape machine to me. Do you know what I mean? I know how I use it to, to map out songs when I'm writing. When I'm creating sounds from scratch, I tend to use machine because machine feels like a tool to me, right? This feels like a, a little canvas because I'm not looking at a full 
track. Uh, I'm looking at loops a lot of the time. That's the problem with Machine, is you can get stuck in loops, and it's not great for tracking out full songs. Um, for, for making sounds, it's great because I can function on like one pad, right? Like I was doing, I can have this sound might be a kick. I'm adding another effect, another effect, and I can do that with shortcuts. So that's the main reason I use Machine is just the hands-on control. I feel more like I'm interacting with the sounds than I'm just uh, either inputting data into a menu or I'm just clicking things to do it. But as I say, like it's not essential at all. If you have a machine, I'd, I'd recommend playing around with sounds, particularly for doing sound design. It's great for messing around. Um, yeah, when it comes to making songs, I'm still using Reason, though. Good question. Do we have any more questions in the room? Hello. Um, I would Hi. like to ask you, um, how did you get into the sample pack creating business? Like. Were you scouted, or did you just start to create your own sounds and thought they were interesting and started to like send them out? Or yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't think most like any two people who are making samples tend to come into it the same way. There's like so many ways into doing it. Um, it wasn't really an industry up until a couple of years ago. Like as in a formal industry, it was kind of lots of disparate, separate companies. Some good, not so some, some not so great. A lot of freelance producers. Uh, making packs for different companies, some of them working for all the companies, some of them working for just one. You had small teams, you had bigger companies who had tons of freelancers on the roster, and then you had uh, bigger audio companies who are obviously either creating sounds in-house or they're also licensing sounds from some of these freelance companies as well. So there's like so many routes in, and none of that information was really available until very recently. Um, I started by um, kind of touching on at the beginning, I was kind of making sounds myself, um, not deliberately. I was just doing this, essentially, um, playing around with my sounds because, I, again, it wasn't as easy to find the sounds that I wanted as it is now. So I was, you know, I had sample packs that I was buying a zip file, which I didn't know what was in the zip file and hoping that like, there'd be something good in it, which was, you know, that's, that's crazy. That's only a couple of years ago. Um, and then, you know, because you'd spent the money, I'd be like, right, this is, these are the drums I'm using for the next two months because I... I've spent 30 pounds on this, so like I need to make these kicks work. So I learned a lot of it through that, and then started actually learning how to like work with generating sounds. Started recording sounds. Started recording percussive sounds. One of the biggest thing takeaways from this was that most of the drum sounds you hear don't start out as that drum sound. As in kicks, don't usually start someone recording a kick, which kind of seems obvious at this point because we a lot of us know some kind of drum synthesis, whether it's just in like Max for Live or it's like some kind of, you know, like plug-in drum machine or samples. We kind of understand some of that now. But when you start making samples, you're thinking, I, I want to record a kick. I need to either record a kick or I need to get an 808 drum machine. Or like, you know, it was, it was pretty obvious that like a kick's a kick. And one of the things we started with was pretty much none of the stuff is what you think it is. It's made from some other percussive element, something that could be percussive becomes a drum sound. And that's how you get unique sounds, is not starting from the place where you thought. So I was kind of doing that, but not thinking it was samples. My SoundCloud was starting to kick off at the time. This is like six, seven years ago, and SoundCloud was like proper popping, and there was like producer communities, and people were giving feedback, and it meant something. So I decided, OK, I'm going to put some of my sounds out for free. Um, my brother actually said to me at the time, um, why don't we send it to a, a sample company? Um, I didn't really think I should do that because I thought that's what professionals did. You know, I thought there was like this other level of professionals who were making it who weren't the producers I knew making music. It was professional sound designers. Um, sent some stuff out and I started working with a company called Loop Masters. Um, I did like three packs freelance and then uh, finding out that samples was a real thing. Um, started to like, you know, be able to take one less day work in my job at a coffee shop, which I was doing at the time. Um, to put all of that back into spending time making more sounds because it was the first thing in music where I'd really seen any like real money that was actually making a difference to my life. I was DJing like three nights a week as well, but it wasn't making a huge difference. Like we all do it. I was just doing gigs that were like a little bit of supplementing my travel and stuff really. Um, so yeah, off the back of doing some packs with a, with a company, uh, we launched our own label, which I didn't really know what that meant at the time. It was just, again, it was like a wrapper for we're going to do more of this. Uh, we're making a something that seems to be a product which we didn't know people wanted until we found out about that world and we started throwing all of our time at it. So it was it was just a matter of us spending three or four years spending all our time learning, wanting to get better. As I said, like the reason I learned machine was purely because I needed to learn it and it was like do it or don't do it. So it was the first time I ever read a manual because I, I needed to know, so I started reading it. Um, if you're interested in getting into this and this is something um, that appeals to you beyond just making sounds for your own music. 
and you're interested in perhaps selling those samples or being able to get paid for your creative time, uh, I recommend learning the basics of making your own, own sounds first because it's the easiest like stumbling block is getting in the door but then finding out you don't have the skills yet. And that doesn't mean spending 10 years learning. It simply means this stuff, playing around with sound until you understand the basics of it, going out with a field recorder and start recording stuff. It doesn't mean you have to use it straight away, but just getting your head around listening to sound in a different way and knowing that uh, a, a new snare isn't a snare and a, and a clap from two different sample packs put together. Um, it, it is, it's the basics of it, um, but you'd be surprised how open companies are now to people making samples if you've got a great demo, if you're working in a professional way, and that doesn't have to be an entire ready to go for sale sample pack, but putting something together that you've thought about the details, you've thought about how you name your files, you've thought about some kind of, the things we talked about, right? The same things that might appeal to you as someone who might look at those samples, a piece of artwork or a demo song that might appeal to you, that's the same thing companies are looking for. They're looking for a hook. So flip side of that is just set up your own cell fi and sell your sounds. Do it that way and let people come to you. That's an option now that didn't exist when I got into this, which is if you have any kind of an audience, you have any kind of social media, you have any kind of like uh, peers that do the same thing as you, start making your own sounds, do it in a legit way, set yourself up and, and just go do it and, and it will come to you. Wow. Um, can I also ask you, you were also mentioning uh, the collaboration with Spinning. It's going to be more in the near future. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What can we expect in the, in the near future of the collaboration? So from what I know, um, I've been working with the Splice Artist team who've been working with Spinning. And um, I'm not sure what packs I can announce yet. Um, I can tell you that there's really, really good packs coming. Obviously, there's the Big Room pack. I know there's another one coming very soon. Um, someone from Splice can probably tell me what I can announce or not. Um, but from what I know, there are genre packs coming. So that's packs that are what you'd expect from spinning, but in the best way possible. It's like these foundational elements, these sounds that you'd like to get your hands on, created by uh, some of the people on the team with spinning. There's also artist packs coming as well, which I don't know what I can announce or not. But uh, for those of you who are spinning fans, uh, I'm sure you're going to be happy with what's coming. And also the fact that it's coming on Splice, uh, you can dig in and explore these sounds and find the best elements that you're looking for. All right. Um I think that's the last question for right now. Um, I really love your vision on, on how to create and play with the samples. Your, your focus is amazing. Uh, I want to thank you from Spinning Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank you. make some noise for Mr. Capson. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. <laughs>